Hello, for uh, how long have I been here? 24 years, actually. This would be my first Not continuously. Huh? Not continuously. Not continuously. Okay, so the title of my talk is The uh, Cosmic Rays Energy Spectrum Measured by Tail, the Tail Detector, which would mean absolutely nothing to many of you without a long introduction to the field and to the experiments, uh, especially the ones uh, conducted here at Utah. Utah has a long history of cosmic ray research, especially in the experimental uh, field. And I will go through an introduction to cosmic rays, how to measure them, what we've done over the past many years. And finally, the title of my talk would be the last item on this list. And for that, if you would excuse me for a second, I do need to start my timer. Okay. All right. So, cosmic rays. Um, and I also should mention one thing. Because of the long history of cosmic ray research at this university, many people in this room have heard this talk from many different people many, many different times. Uh, some of you have not. I assume graduate students just starting out probably don't know much about uh, cosmic rays, so I'm going to go through the history, but I'll, I'll be quick to spare the rest of you the pain of listening to the same thing 20 times. Okay, discovered in 1912, okay? Uh, cosmic ray radiation, particles coming from above. After a long time of research, a lot of measurements, we now have a picture of the energy or the cosmic ray flux from very low energies around GeV up to 10 to the 20th and above, which is 10 to the 11 uh, GeV. Ultra high energy cosmic rays, which is the region we study here at Utah, is the tail of the spectrum right here. These are the very highest energies cosmic rays and uh, harder to, hardest to measure because of their very low uh, flux. You can see these numbers indicate how many particles you actually can observe with a detector of a given size. So if you have a meter square detector, you would expect to see one particle per year at 10 to the 15. You go up here. You need a century to see a particle in one kilometer square detector. So the flux goes down very quickly. But it's almost a straight line. So it's almost a power law with a constant uh, spectral index, with the exception of some slight deviations, which we give names to, like a knee and the ankle. I'm going to talk about the second knee uh, as well. Okay, so what are they? What are cosmic rays? They're just matter. So, uh, atomic nuclei. And at low energies, where you can take a satellite detector or put a detector on a satellite and actually measure what type of uh, atom it is or nucleus, you can actually see the distribution of the various nuclei. This is energy range below 10 to the 15 eV. You go higher in energy, then you get to the point where you can't measure them directly, you have to go indirect measurement, you cannot really resolve the different nuclei and you say, well, we're seeing something heavy, we're seeing something light. We think they're protons or we think they're iron uh, on that level of accuracy. Now, I showed you the energy of those particles. Now, if you think of a normal hydrogen atom, a nucleus having an energy of 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16, how did it get it? How do you get a particle to that? high energy, well, it's a complicated problem, which uh, the main theory 
is based on the ideas of uh, Fermi acceleration, shock wave acceleration, whereby a particle would gain energy through interaction with the uh, uh, with magnetic clouds or shock shock fronts, uh, etc. But a full theory of the acceleration is not there yet. In addition, the locations or the sources of these cosmic ray particles are not fully understood, especially as you go to the highest energies. So below 10 to the 15, below the knee of the spectrum, we believe acceleration happens in uh, supernova remnants. But you go to 10 to the 18 electron volt, 10 to the 20th electron volt, and you start finding out that you run out of possible candidate sources. That is, the astrophysical object that you look at is either not energetic enough or not big enough or does not have the ability to contain or confine a particle long enough to accelerate it to such high energies. So the question of where they come from uh, is still an unresolved uh, problem. Wait, uh, where are shocks? Hmm? What's a shock? It's like uh, particle, uh, the field traveling faster than uh, the speed of sound. Oh. Or, yeah. Okay. All right, and a as you run out of possible sources, uh, theorists start devising uh, different exotic scenarios by which to produce particles, such as uh, the case of heavy, super heavy particles uh, of, cos well, whatever. Particles beyond the standard model. X particles. In other words, maybe there's clues to new physics in there. But you do have to exhaust the uh, more traditional explanations before you actually can go there. Okay, detection. If the flux is high enough, say 10 to the 12 electron volt energies, you have enough particles that you can actually put a, put a detector on a balloon or on a satellite and actually see the particle or de detect it in your uh, instrument. <coughs> However, as the flux gets really low, you cannot build big enough detectors to send into space. Uh, the only alternative you have is to detect the particles through the extensive air showers that they generate when they interact with, a, with, an, atmos with an air molecule. So, a cosmic ray particle impinges on the atmosphere, collides with a nitrogen or an oxygen molecule. Sorry. It starts a chain reaction, a cascade, where it produces uh, many elementary particles. And in each collision or in each decay step, the energy of the, orig the original energy of the particle is subdivided into the resulting particles. And okay, excuse me, this is my first time with this thing. And what you end up with is a cascade where the energy of the particle just flows through, produces many particles, and you end up with a shower. It's what we call an, air, an extensive air shower. An extensive means it spreads out uh, in the atmosphere. So one way you can detect them is you, put, is you build a ground array of detectors. Okay, so you have a particle detector, you put it somewhere, go some distance away, say a kilometer, put another one, another one, another one, spread them out, <coughs> and wait for particles to hit your detector. The shower particles will spread at lar to large enough distances and, and areas that you can actually see a footprint of the shower on the ground. And from that footprint, you can work your way back and reconstruct or estimate the original particle's energy and arrival direction. Now, another, 
Another product of this shower is fluorescence, fluorescent photons. So as the particles, the charged particles, travel through the atmosphere, they produce actually two kinds of light, shrink of light. The particles travel faster than the speed of light in air. These are relativistic particles. And they also produce uh, fluorescent light. Fluorescent light is when the charged particles go through and excite the nitrogen molecules in the air. And exciting the, elect the nitrogen molecules, the molecules relax by emitting ultraviolet light. So give back the energy they gained uh, by giving uh, out ultraviolet light. Okay, Fluorescent, fluorescence uh, is an important <coughs> Uh, point because that's how we do it or how we measure cosmic rays in Utah. Okay, so some history. The idea came out in the 60s or actually was worked on in the 50s, but to detect air showers was then in the 60s. Um, and Utah was the first is that on this slide now? Okay, so an important difference between fluorescence and the ground array, something that I should point out, is that with a ground array experiment, you build your detector and you wait for showers to hit your detector. Okay, so you have a fixed area whereby the shower has to land for you to see it. With air fluorescence, you build an instrument bigger than this room and you look out through to the atmosphere and you will see showers uh, a few kilometers 10 kilometers 20 kilometers away from you. and the other important point is that with air fluorescence you see the central portion of the track which is something we maybe we'll come back to later Okay, so your detector is at this room. You see a shower that's 10 or 20 kilometers away from you. What you actually see with your camera is some light source moving through your field of view at the speed of light. So you have a very fast camera and you see an image. Okay, so how do you work back from light in your camera to reconstructing where the shower happened and how much light it actually produced. You know how much light you see, but how much light did it actually produce depends on how far away is it from you. So when we talk about shower reconstruction, this is basically what we mean. We have some image data and from it we need to estimate how far away did the shower uh, develop, in what direction relative to us, and how much light did it actually produce. And this is a multi-step process uh, whereby, and this is, this technique by the way was developed here, uh, the fly's eye uh, experiment. So this is you, your detector, this is the shower. First thing you want to do is figure out the geometry. Where did it occur in the atmosphere? Once you have the ge once you have the geometry, you do, you do that in two steps. You find a plane that contains your detector and the line, which is supposed to be the shower. Then, using timing, like I said, very fast cameras, uh, you can estimate uh, the the orientation, the angle in that plane that the shower develops at. Now, once you figure out the geometry, you look at the light that you see in your camera, you map it back, like each, each pixel in your camera should point to a point along that shower uh, development line, and from there you estimate how much light was produced at the shower. 
Now, why do you care about how much light was produced at the shower? Because, as it turns out, the amount of light produced at the shower is directly proportional to the number of particles at that point in the shower. So by knowing how much light some portion of the shower emitted, you can estimate how many particles, and particles meaning electrons for the most part, how many electrons exist along the shower track at that point. Okay, then you take that another step from, uh, from particle physics. You know how many particles should be produced by an, a primary particle with a given energy. So you keep working your way back from light at your detector, light at the shower, number of particles at the shower, and from there you can estimate the total energy deposited by that primary particle such that it would produce uh, this, this type of shower. Okay, and the number of particles in the shower is what we call the shower profile. Okay, so this is basically uh, number of particles or sometimes we look at just the number of uh, produced photons uh, equivalent Okay, and we look at the development curve of this shower. The, the shape of those showers is, is pretty universal, meaning that most particles will produce very similar showers uh, in terms of they rise, they fall, they peak at some point. The depth at which they peak, and this is depth in the atmosphere, Okay, if I look straight up, there's about 800 grams of matter above us here in Utah. So that's what this slant depth means. If you integrate the air density from here to the top of the atmosphere, you get something like 800 grams, but that's going up. If you go at a slant depth, if you go at some angle, you're going to see more atmosphere and then bigger angle, more atmosphere. So when we talk about slant depth, that's what we're talking about. And how, how deep the, that profile peaks depends to a large extent on what type of primary particle produced that shower. So if you're looking at, if the primary particle was a proton, it will tend to produce deeper, deeper profiles or deeper uh, curves. Whereas if it was iron, it would be on average. So 100 protons or 100 iron nuclei, you look at the distributions, and the nuclei and the iron would be shallower than the protons. So by measuring this value, you can get a hint about what is the composition of those cosmic rays. Okay. I mean, forget about saying this is proton, helium, beryllium, etc. You can just have a statistical measure. The area under the curve, that's pretty much the energy. Okay, no, I'm taking too long. Okay, a uh, quick overview of the history. The idea of air fluorescence, or using air fluorescence to measure cosmic rays, was developed in the 1960s. Okay? But it's a tough measurement. This, this, this is not easy to do. And you have to have nature cooperate with you, which in Utah it did. Okay? Dry atmosphere, clear skies, that helps. So the fly's eye experiment was the first successful experiment to measure uh, cosmic rays or air showers using the air fluorescence technique. And two of the pioneers, Professor Sokolsky, who's sitting right there, and Professor Cassidy, which I guess is not sitting in this room, uh, won the Panofsky Prize for their contribution to the field. Mm -hmm. 
And that original Flyzer experiment still holds the record for the highest energy particle ever detected, which is 3 times 10 to the 20th electron volt. That's, that's very high for a, for a particle, for a subatomic particle. Do you have the, the rate expectation for a particle of that energy? What is the, like one particle per hundred square per time? It should be one less than one per century per square kilometer, but we've only seen one. <laughs> <laughs> Less than a century. Less than a century. Many more than one square kilometers. OK. So you have a successful experiment. You see exciting physics. You build a bigger, better experiment. OK? And that's what the uh, high resolution fly eye is. OK? So. The camera pixels that you use to look at the sky, how how how, you know you know you all know. You know your telephone screens have more and more pixels as time goes by, so that's what we do. We went from six degree pixels to one degree pixel, pixels. So that would have been what, twelve or fourteen or sixteen? Yeah, fourteen. Fourteen. Okay. I should I shouldn't embarrass myself like that, but it's okay. <laughs> Okay, so bigger mirrors, uh, smaller pixels, better electronics, yada yada. Okay, you run that for uh, almost 10 years, you get to see more data, and at the highest energies, statistics is the limiting factor. Statistics is the only, well not the only thing, but it's, it's the main thing that prevents you from really seeing what's going on. So for example, out here, this is the flux. Look at the error bars. They're just huge. That's because it takes years to measure a few events from which you can make your measurement. Okay, remember that uh, I showed you a plot of the flux going down like that over 11 decades of energy. We're looking for features in that flux, which if you plot it the way we did, or the way I did before, you're not going to see them. They're just going to be little wiggles. So to see those features, since the flux seems to fall like e to the minus 3, so it, it goes like the energy, or 1 over the energy cubed. So you just multiply it by e cubed. So if it, if it was actually just an e to the minus 3, then it would look like a straight line when multiplied with the e cubed. If there are features in there, there are little wiggles, then they show up clearly uh, on this type of plot. Okay, so same thing, but everything now is multiplied by e cubed to look at the, the more, the finer details. The end of the spectrum, this is, this is an important result. It was achieved here. Um, so we see the, an end of the spectrum, but why did it end? Why are there, uh, why is the flux not going on like this? Okay, so one possible reason the physical explanation that we're, uh, we believe we saw is a mechanism by which high energy protons will interact with the cosmic microwave background and lose their energy. There's a threshold energy at which this process becomes uh, efficient or comes into play. And at that energy, if you have cosmic ray particles with higher energies, they will lose their energy and show up as lower energy particles. So that's why we believe uh, the flux terminates or tapers <laughs> off or dies off or however you want to call it. Uh, however, a different experiment, a different cosmic ray experiment, a ground array experiment, 
at the same time or same time frame that we were seeing a cutoff, they were actually seeing events above the cutoff. Okay, so we now have two experiments reporting different results. And the, the way you handle that is you sit down with them, try to understand what they're doing, you explain to them what you're doing, and you work together at resolving the uh, discrepancy in your results. If you co-locate the experiments, you do the same type of experiment they're doing, same type of experiment we're doing here at the same location, so you see the same events, the same showers, then maybe you can resolve uh, the, the discrepancy. Okay, and that's when how the telescope array was born. Japanese collaborators uh, working doing ground array stuff and Utah doing surface or doing fluorescence work together and build the telescope array. Here's some ground detectors down here. Some more details. Here's one in the field. This should be 1.1 kilometers. This is diagonal. Okay. Okay. So fun experiment. Okay. Uh, remember, my ex the, what, the experiment I'm working on is TAIL, which is TA low energy extension. So this is TA, and it's a hybrid experiment. Means it has a ground array overlooked by fluorescence detectors. The idea is you see the same events in both types of instruments and cross-calibrate the two experiments. And with, with the two types of detectors, you actually have a better measurement of the showers and can do a better reconstruction. TA has a large surface detector, 700 square kilometers. 500 uh, detectors spread out over 700 square kilometers and it's overlooked by three fluorescence detectors and these are the event displays of the same event, the same shower seen in three separate fluorescence uh, detectors as well as the SD, the surface detector. Okay, so after several years of, or many years of working, uh, the results of the surface of, of the telescope array confirm uh, the end of the spectrum. They also see or confirm a feature in the spectrum which uh, is referred to as the ankle. And uh, I'm, I'm going to go through quickly, through some of these quickly to get to my... Uh, main topic, so if I'm going too fast, stop me, if you need to ask me something. Okay, so the main uh, reason for building TA was to understand the discrepancy in the GZK, or the uh, cutoff at the highest energies, and we now find, um, this is an old slide, four years with more years, same thing. The spectrum uh, terminates or tapers off at the highest energies. And to understand why the ground array was giving a result that's different from this, the fluorescence detector, we use the events seen in both types of detectors to cross calibrate. And we found that if you estimate the shower energy, the particle energy using the surface detector, you on average get an energy which is 30% which is higher than what you would estimate using the fluorescence detector. Okay. So we now understand the difference between the results for the, for the spectrum by understanding that for a particular shower, particular cosmic ray, the SD or the, the ground array would overestimate the energy uh, versus the, the fluorescence detector. We trust 
the FD energy better because the FD or the air fluorescence looks at the looks at the body of the shower. Okay, if, if I'm uh, so the shower is actually billions and billions of particles traveling through the atmosphere. Ninety-nine percent of those particles are very close to the center or to the track of that of that air shower, and that's what the FDs see. But it's an extensive air shower in the sense it spreads out over kilometers, and it's that spreading out the number of particles that say one or two kilometers away from the center is what the SD sees. So there's more fluctuations. There's also other uh, difficulties in physics. What is the energy resolution of an individual? Uh, like, can you measure it to five percent or two? Twenty to ten. We can we can do ten, I think. <clears throat> Okay, so um, okay, okay, sorry. We need your son here. No, <laughs> yeah, he he would figure it out quickly. Okay, so again, um, uh, the telescope array did not just measure the energy spectrum. Uh, of course, with the three FDs and with the surface detector, we have other uh, research going on to measure the composition and to also study the arrival directions of these particles. You know, the, the uh, I don't know how to explain this, how sad it is, but they're charged particles. Okay, cosmic rays are charged particles, meaning you see one and doesn't matter how well you can reconstruct its arrival direction. When you point it back up at the sky, you can't really point it back to its source. Because as a charged particle traveling through the interstellar and intergalactic magnetic fields, it will get deflected from its, uh, from its original path. And so, uh, you can't just point at sources. You have to get all your data, plot it on the sky, look at distributions, and see does it look like it's coming from all over the place? Does it look like it's coming from, say, the galactic plane? Is there an excess? Is there a deficit? Is there some non-uniformity in the distribution of arrival directions? Um, and, and that's as, as best as you can do. And the situation gets better the higher you go in energy because the higher you go in energy, the less deflections uh, you're going to see. And you can review your physics uh, textbooks for that. But uh, the important point is at the very highest energies, above 10 to the 19.6 or 0.57, which is the GZK energy, we still see a few events, and using those few events, when you plot the distributions, you see an excess in a region of the sky, which is probably, the, so far, the best hint we have at some possible source or sources existing in that direction of the sky. So what do you do when you see something exciting? You build a bigger and better detected. Okay, so we've been running the telescope array. This is the surface detector of the telescope array as it exists now. This is 700 square kilometers. And this is the future additions to TA building two more surface detectors which will increase the size of the of the detector overall by almost a factor of four because we do need statistics we need events we need to have more events to understand anything about anything okay so this is an, an upgrade to TA down here is another upgrade which is at a much more advanced stage at this point 
That's tail. That's the tail SD. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to skip the physics introduction for tail. I'm just going to say uh, in words a, a few words about it. Ten to the seventeen electron volt, ten to the sixteen. These energies, we believe that galactic sources of cosmic rays will start to die off. You can't produce ten to the nineteen electron volt uh, events in the galaxy. So at some point between, say, 10 to the 16, 10 to the 17, 10 to the 19, we expect a transition of the sources from being galactic to extragalactic. And experiments going as far back as the fly's eye have been seeing hints and trying to figure out or see clues as to where does that transition happen and how to best study it. Tail is there to do the same thing. Okay, so very briefly, the physics uh, we see an ankle structure that's about 10 to the 18 and a half. Um, the fly's eye experiment saw the ankle. This is a change in the spectral slope of the flux. Okay, and why does it change? Because something is happening. So, an idea was, this is where you get the transition between galactic and extragalactic. You expect the type of primary cosmic rays to change as well. So you look at X max, X max, the depth of the shower profile, the maximum, tells you something about composition. We see hints from older experiments, you look at these are four, there's four or five experiments. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, but you asked about resolution. I mean, there's resolution for how well you can measure an event, and then what is your systematic uncertainty on energy? How well do you actually know your energy? Surface detective versus fluorescence are off by 30%. So you do see a lot of scatter if you look at the individual results. But then if you put them all together, like say, well, they don't know their energies all that well. So let me scale the energies a bit and see if the shape of what they see looks similar. And you see things. Okay, so now moving to the detector itself. Tail is a hybrid detector, same as TA, just a miniature uh, TA. It has a surface array component, and it has a fluorescence detector component. The infill array is going to have 100 counters, and 80 of them are being are deployed now. Okay, so here's, here's another important point. When you build a multi-component detector, an FD and an SD, the deployment schedule is, is often a period of a, of a couple of years or more, and one of the components will go in place before the other. It's complicated uh, business, and so the tail SD is now in place. It's going through a uh, shakedown to get ready for uh, measurements. However, the tail FD, and I think I might have mixed up the order of my slides. But the tail FD, which is fluorescence detected, 10 telescopes built next to existing 14 telescopes. And these 10 telescopes shown here have been in place since 2013. Okay, so the FD uh, got to be ready for data taking much uh, sooner than the SD. Main reason being, we these are old high-res telescopes, so we already have them in storage, or had them in storage at the time. So we just move them, put things together, and run. 
And, and so, because we had them in place much sooner than the SD, we used this collection of telescopes, these 10 telescopes, as a standalone detector. So even though tail is a hybrid detector, what I'm going to be talking about from now on is just, or what I'm going to be calling tail, is really uh, these 10 telescopes. Not even the 14, not the full FD site, just the 10 telescopes above. Okay, I have three minutes to go through my spectrum measurement. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, tail. It's a, an FD detector running by itself, monocular. And the first thing you want to do is reconstruct your events. And so we use a technique called a uh, profile constraint fitting, where, which is a pretty much a global fit. So you get the geometry, you get the profile, you combine everything together, and you d use that procedure. Uh, reason you do that is looking at the traditional or the standard procedure compared with this procedure. And you find out that in, in monocular observations, you get better reconstruction using this procedure. You give up a few things, but you get uh, better energy reconstruction. Okay, so we employed it. We've, we've done this before, so we just uh, use it for tail. And now, when we looked at events where the fluorescence light dominated, we got results as we've been seeing for with high res much longer ago or much longer ago, and same with with uh, with tail. However, with tail, when you look straight up or very high angle, at very high angles, you start seeing more events which are pointing at you. Pointing at you means they produce, uh, or the shrink of light they produce is going to be pointed at you. Did not discuss this, but shrink of light is actually beamed along the shower development. Fluorescence light emitted isotropically, shrink of light points at you. When uh, we use the profile constraint fitting with shrink of events, we found that it actually works well, actually better than, than it does with fluorescence events. Now the reason why uh, we care about shrink of in this case, if the light is pointed at you, and if a shower produces roughly uh, similar amounts of fluorescence light and shrink of light, okay, so you have about the same amount of light produced in the shower. Fluorescence light is emitted isotropically, so it goes into 4 pi. Fluorescence li uh, shrink of light is beamed. So it goes in like a cone, which is uh, a couple of degrees around the shower track. Same amount of light focused into a beam. What that means is events or showers with much lower energies. If, the, if that light they produce is beamed at you, you can actually see them. If your detector is designed to see fluorescence events at 10 to the 17, then it will also see Shurenkov events at 10 to the 15, because that amount of light is just beamed at you. Okay, so that was, that was a good development. It allowed us to extend the measurement to much lower energies. Okay. So I've been showing you, or I've showed you the flux measured with the AM high res. What is flux? Uh, or the energy spectrum? It's just accounting the number of particles that fall in a, in a given amount of time over a certain uh, area. So it's a particle flux. Uh, flux is number of events. Well, uh, you want to correct for your detector. So you want to remove your instrument from the equation. And you do that by 
uh, correcting for the exposure or the aperture of your detected. Okay, the flux does not, should not depend on whether you observe for an hour or a day or a year. So you have to correct for these factors. Okay, the result I'm going to show you is based on 1,000 hours of data, which is collected over almost two years. Um, if I haven't mentioned, we can only run these types of ex experiments at night. We're looking for very faint light signals. So if the moon is up, we don't run the FB. Okay, if, if, so it has to be at night, the weather has to be nice, no, so no clouds. Yeah. And over two years of observation or thereabouts where we collected uh, 1,000 hours worth of data, reconstruct that data, and look at the uh, events or the number of events, about 300 something, 330,000 events survive. The vast majority of these events are, of course, very low energies. The flux does fall off rapidly. And most of them are Sherenkov dominated. Uh, to calculate the flux from the number of events, you need to calculate uh, your aperture, meaning how big or how efficient is your detector at, at seeing uh, these showers, or how well, how far can it see, how well does it see. Um, this is, first of all, geometrical, so you can see out to 5 kilometers versus you can see out to 10 kilometers, and uh, these plots are meant to show you that we do, in the simulation, which we use to calculate the aperture, that we do match the data reasonably well. Um, the detection efficiency, okay, and so the detection efficiency means if you see 10 events in a given volume in a given time, does that mean that 10 events or 10 primary particles fell into that volume in that given time? No, chances are you have less than 100% efficiency for detection. So if 100 events fell, you recorded 50, you need to correct for that. Uh, and that efficiency turns out to depend on the uh, particle type. So you will, if you see 100, if, if 100 proton primaries fell, you might see 60 of them. If 100 nuclear, uh, iron nuclei fell, you might see only 30 or 40. Okay, so there's a dependence on the type of particle uh, which we have to correct for, and we do. Uh, the aperture, and from it the exposure, which is just the aperture times uh, the time, the observation time turns out to be a slightly more complicated function than we would like, but it's, it's well understood uh, from uh, the experiment. And it's, it looks like that. And from it, we measure the energy spectrum. So this is, this is our main result. Or I'll show you a nicer plot than this. Um, well, let me skip this plot since we're out of time. OK, this would be the result that, that uh, you're staying over time for. Uh, the flux, how many particles per unit time, per unit area that we see. And it looks like this. So you look at it and you want to understand the features. Don't know much about what's going on here. We do know that this feature, this hump, happens at where, at an energy where a, the very famous knee of the uh, cosmic ray spectrum occurs. This is about 10 to the 15.6, or 4 times 10 to the 15. And up here, we see a break in the spectrum, meaning it's doing something, then it does something else. 
this is what we think is the second knee. And that's actually, um, or could be an indication of where uh, iron uh, terminates. So, I'll, uh, so the knee, the knee and the flux. When you look at different primaries, so protons, helium, iron, they follow different paths or, or different uh, flux uh, termination points. Okay, and so if you can, if you believe this is proton and you think this might be iron, we don't know what this is yet. But if the energies of the two features match or are similar, then maybe you're seeing something. Okay, so uh, composition is, is our next step, which I'll skip and a summary. Okay, so... Uh, Can I ask a question? Sure. So weren't you going to say something about the difference between those two energies? So, this energy of the second knee, the, the, the steepening of the spectrum at 17.05 is about 30 times higher than the energy of the knee. Now, we think there's a the relation between where different primaries will terminate is given by their uh, Z, or by the atomic number, right? Why? Well, not now. Uh, so I, because of, I mean, it's, it's confinement in the magnetic field. Magnetic <laughs> field confinement depends on their charge. What about acceleration? Uh, not now, John. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 10 minutes behind schedule, so let me finish up. Okay. So, and that's that's my talk. Sorry for taking longer than that. behind this, why is it e to the minus 3 over so many orders of magnitude with only small corrections? Is that fully understood? I, I don't know how fully understood. The, the Fermi acceleration uh, or uh, theories based on it will produce a source spectrum of e to the minus 2, I, I believe. And then propagation will, will lose you another uh, one over here. Propagation? Propagation. I, I think. Maybe I maybe I have that right, do I? Yeah. So so qualitatively I think it's it's understood, but in, in detail I don't know. Well, that's the most remarkable thing about the spectrum to me. Not, True. Not why there are little <laughs> knees and ankles and things. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, if we, if we give up on the big question, we pull up, we chase the, uh, the details, I guess. So my question is uh, another like, more positive part than this kind of minus three. So I think follow like minus three very closely. But this transition point like from uh, the knee or the ankle, like, you know, why is the amplitude of these different components you know, uh, so similar? So like you have like you know like a, you, know, you change the component like you know, from iron to proton, but the amplitude is uh, yes, very similar. We change from galactic to extragalactic. You know, so no jumps. Yeah, no jump, no big jumps. So why is that? That seems very you know, kind of coincidence. Um, yeah. Point out the vertical scale theorem. <laughs> it's not because of the errors, apparently. Point out the vertical scale theorem. What about the vertical scale? Plus this, what are you actually plotting? Yeah. The E cubed, do you mean? Or what? Yeah, those two points are not at the same height. Yeah, but you know, as a tradition point, like, you know, the, 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 these two components, the different components are different origins of this cosmic Well, I mean, they, I, I'm using that very close. I, 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 the, the, there's not going to be any energy the, where the, everything the switches over from not A to B. Because he's plotting flux times energy cubed. That point and that point do not have the same flux. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, no, he's, he's so asking, he's, he's, he's asking about this point yeah. versus this point. 
right? Yes. Yeah, if this is a transition, why are they so close together? Um, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think anything happens in a sharp way. Yeah, but there's so, two, two different origins, two different like, you know, components. Um, so why is galactic, the other is called galactic. So why is that galactic, you know, I think it's basically... So like, again, I, I don't think the galactic, extragalactic transition happens at a point. It, it might be a full decade of energy why? where things just taper or die off here and start to come on at a different point. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think we understand the, uh, or we don't have the accuracy in, in the energy uh, estimation to. So, well, actually, I, I, I don't. They're not supposed to be uh, smooth. We do expect things. Huh? If you compare, you compare to. In general, you have a particle with charged particles, charged Z. How the intensity of fluorescence scales with this? The fluorescence is produced by the electrons, not not the the proton. Yeah. So how how does it? <coughs> If you, if you have a proton and, and an iron nuclei with the same energy, so they produce how many particles? And how is the ratio? Um, it's, it's almost, I would say, one. There's a question of, of missing energy, so particles which... or energy that goes into producing uh, neutrinos or deeply penetrating muons, which doesn't show up in our energy. That's a 10% effect, maybe. I simply take the particle, increase its charge, and study how the impact produced of this particle on the atmosphere scales the charge. Is it charge square or charge to the fourth particle? I'm, I'm not sure I understand your question. He's, he's asking you if the how the interaction of your primary particle at the top of the atmosphere depend on the charge of the primary particle. And the question I think he needs to ask is, instead of charges, how does it vary with the mass? Yeah, charge is not... With very high energies, it's not electromagnetic, so it doesn't... These are nuclear interactions. Nuclear interaction is not tied to charge, it's tied to A. Excitation of atmosphere by charged particle. Uh, those are all, all electrons. The shower. The shower is all electrons. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I have a question. I guess so. If the shower is all electrons, how do you identify the primary particle to us? Um, we, we from the shape of the profile. So if it develops high up in the atmosphere, it reaches maximum uh, higher up in the atmosphere, it's more likely a, a heavier nuclei. Okay. But yeah, we can't tell on a, on a shower by shower basis. So do you expect to be able to improve? I look like the data that you're getting is much better quality than what I've seen on the screens before. Do you think you're going to be able to make a significant improvement in the particle identification, uh, protons versus iron? Um, well, with, with the amount of statistics, maybe we can uh, do a more uh, precise, although not necessarily accurate. So maybe, <laughs> maybe uh, you know, we can start talking about proton, helium, um, carbon, and iron. So maybe we can start to separate. But on a shower by shower, I don't think that's ever going to happen, um, unless there's a surprise somewhere I'm not aware of. Um, so yeah, I hope I hope we can do better than proton and iron.
Uh, and that's when I say we, we fit the X max distributions, I'm actually using four primaries to do so. But how well can I tell proton from helium? That's still uh, an open question. I mean, I haven't closed that one. Proton and helium will develop very similarly. So it's tricky to tell them apart. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it looks better just because you know, I'm doing that.